Hello, everybody, and welcome to this brief training on trauma-informed care. My name is Alyssa Jessberger. I am a licensed clinical social worker with Pillars Community Health. I am the Director of Training and Professional Development in this organization, and I will be presenting with... Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Alderman. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. Uh, I am uh, the Chief Behavioral Health Officer for the Federally Qualified Health Center at Pillars Community Health. So a little background on uh, the organization of Pillars Community Health. We are a both a federally qualified health center, so an FQHC, as well as a community mental health center. So we serve clients across the spectrum of medical, dental, and behavioral health services. And we have also gone through a one and a half year consulting process with an um, outside consultant on really looking at our organization and um, implementing some trauma-informed care practices. So we are looking forward to doing this uh, presentation with you today. So trauma is a word that we hear a lot about. Um, it's pretty prevalent. It's kind of a a trendy word right now, and it's helpful to have a shared understanding of what trauma is. So this is a short video. It's not made by Pillars Community Health, um, but it's a it's a good overview of what is trauma and what is trauma informed care. So let's just take a moment to watch this together. You know the old saying, don't judge a book by its cover? Well, the same is true when you assess a patient. Hi. I'm Dr. Cruz. Early in my career, I noticed a pattern with some of my patients. They often had multiple health issues, were uneasy during office visits, and frequently visited the emergency department. But worst of all, they never got better despite multiple visits. Then I realized something. From an early age, many of my patients were exposed to trauma and adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs. This includes emotional, sexual, or physical abuse, violence, neglect, discrimination, poverty, and other adverse events. ACEs are more common in the U.S. than you'd think. In fact, 60% of U.S. adults have one ACE, 25% have three or more ACEs, and 16% have four or more. ACEs occur in all socioeconomic groups but are more common in low-income and minority populations. For young children, repeated exposure to trauma can impact brain development and literally rewire the brain's response to stress. So as they grow up, many struggle with issues related to emotional regulation, like depression, anxiety, or substance use disorders. Trauma survivors are also more often at risk for chronic diseases, behavioral health problems, and even suicide. Knowing all this, I began to rethink my approach to care. Instead of asking patients, what's wrong with you? I ask, what happened to you? Recognizing that life experiences are often a root cause of poor health is integral to improving patient care. Trauma-informed care has helped me take these experiences into account, providing greater insight into my patients' needs and how to address them. Here are five key ways that healthcare organizations can gradually integrate trauma-informed care into their practices to help patients and staff. First, build awareness and generate buy-in. Involve both staff and patients in adopting a trauma-informed approach. Second, invest in a trauma-informed workforce. Hire staff that embrace trauma-informed care and provide training not only for clinical staff, but also for non-clinical employees like front desk workers or security guards who are often the face of your organization. Next, create an environment that is safe and welcoming for patients and staff. Engage patients in meaningful ways. Ask how they feel and listen. You can also build trust by involving them in their own treatment planning. Finally, identify and treat trauma. Consider a screening approach that works for your patients and ensure that treatments and referral sources are available. These changes take time, but each step improves our ability to connect with and care for patients.
Today, our patients appreciate the changes we've made. Plus, our staff is more in tune with patients, so work is less stressful and more rewarding. Trauma-informed care. It can truly transform the caregiving experience from being treaters to being healers. So one of the things that we look at as a as a health center when we um, are implementing something like this is oftentimes the guidance from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration or SAMHSA, and they have six principles that they apply uh, for trauma informed approaches. Those are safety, trustworthiness and transparency, peer support, collaboration and mutuality, empowerment, voice and choice. Uh, cultural, historical, and gender issues. And I think that I like to make sure that we're applying these both in terms of our patient care, uh, as well as how we interact uh, with each other uh, as coworkers, as teams, um, and things like that. Um, and so we want to talk a little bit about kind of in practice what that looks like and what that might look like as you're kind of entering uh, working in a health center setting. Um, so when you're implementing a trauma-informed uh, approach, you kind of have to look both at organizational practices and clinical practices. Uh, at the beginning of your career, though, you may not actually have, might feel like you have much input into what the organizational practices uh, are. Your organization, you might not necessarily be writing um, uh, writing guidelines or protocols or things like that. Um, but uh, at the same time, I think that you do have ability, whether you're in meetings, consulting about cases or team meetings, things like that, to really advocate for a trauma-informed approach uh, when talking about issues, when talking about when you're rolling out a new process, you know, are we thinking trauma-informed uh, about this, or we're talking about a specific patient, what might be the trauma-informed approach. Uh, and so I think that regardless of what your position is in an organization, it's really important for you to be thinking organizationally about this. Uh, in terms of clinical practices, I think a lot of this comes down to how we collaborate with with our patients. Uh, so uh, you might, um, you, and I like to think about collaboration sort of as uh, on a sort of lar large scale and on a smaller scale. So on a large scale, that might be uh, how you're sort of engaging in collaborative treatment planning uh, with a patient, uh, making sure they're educated and, and they all have all the information that they need. Um, and being thoughtful about their experiences when you're going through that process. But it also might be on a smaller scale uh, when you are, you know, if you're, uh, one thing I hear from our nursing staff is important to them is like when they're going to do a, like a blood pressure, for instance, uh, making sure that they ask permission before they touch the patient. They sort of explain through the process what they're doing to be aware that even if you don't know that somebody has a trauma experience or has these, uh, these traumatic experiences that uh, they may be present and they are commonly present uh, amongst folks. And so, uh, to make sure that uh, folks are well informed and they, you're sort of collaborating with them through the through the process of their uh, of their visit. Um, and then in terms of when it comes down to talking about trauma, whether you're screening or you're just asking questions, I really like that idea of asking not like what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. Uh, but even that can sometimes be a difficult thing uh, to ask. I like to think about it a little bit like you're having guests, guests over to your house uh, and you um, you know, the person walks in and let's say they walk right past you and they ignore your, your greeting and they walk and they go into your basement, they go into your bathroom, they go into your bedroom, they look around, opening drawers, looking through things. It would feel really invasive. Uh, and instead, I think it's important that we as providers sort of stay in the rooms in which we're invited by our patients uh, when having these conversations. Some some good questions that I like to often ask uh, are things like, uh, tell me what what's important for me to know about you and to know about your history uh, in order to be as helpful as I can be today. Uh, I also like to say things like, you must have had a really good reason for that decision you make. Can you help me understand what that reasoning is? And I think the questions like that that are very curious and very open, uh, but also respectful of the patient's boundaries can be, can be really helpful. Um, and I think just overall, I think understanding that uh, the... The, the way that you interact with patients can have a profound impact on whether or not they continue to receive care, whether that care is successful uh, in ways that you don't even realize or may never know. Uh, and so I think that it's just important to always be curious and collaborative uh, in all of your, your interactions with patients uh, as well as your, your colleagues. 
So if you can leave this training with some just key trauma-informed takeaways, the first takeaway that's really important is a shared understanding that trauma is extremely prevalent. Uh, we heard the statistics in that video, and that's just the trauma that people are reporting. Uh, so if we have the shared understanding that there's a likelihood that the patients that you interact with, that your colleagues that you interact with may have experienced one or more traumatic experiences in their early lifetime, it really shapes how we communicate and how we work with not only our clients, but also our colleagues. Um, you also want to make this assumption that trauma might be a part of your patient's client's history before they explicitly share a trauma narrative with you. If um, after a client shares a trauma narrative with you, you decide, okay, it's time for me to be trauma informed, then it's too late. Um, you may have already um, inexplicitly um, had, have done some damage with, with how you've been interacting with the, the client or the patient. And so if you can say to yourself, even if I don't know that a client has experienced trauma, I can act in a trauma informed way from my very first interaction. So thinking of those SAMHSA principles, how can I help the client feel safe? How can I help the client feel empowered? I might not be able to have um, real say in policies and procedures right now, but every interaction that I have with a client can create this ripple effect that helps the client feel safe and cared for um, and is trauma informed. This what's wrong with you shift to what's happened to you. I really like what, what Ryan has said about we go into rooms that we're, we're invited into. So um, this, this phrase of what's happened to you is not necessarily something you're going to ask all of your clients, but it's something that you are going to would hope that you would internalize. So it can be really easy in the day-to-day the -day grind with working with clients who are non-compliant, or who aren't following a certain treatment regimen to start going down this, this problem path. And if we can think about being curious instead of judgmental, asking the questions, hmm, I'm wondering what's getting in the way. I'm, I'm wondering what's going on instead of this person is just, you know, insert whatever kind of insult or frustration that you might have towards this person. So if we can really think about taking a curious stance with our clients um, versus a judgmental stance, that is also a trauma-informed um, way to be with your clients. And then I just like this quote by Plato. I think it really sums up the idea of being trauma-informed and that's be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. Uh, so we're going to end with some resources and references. Uh, so I'll go ahead and kind of scroll through those as I talk. Uh, but I think what I hope you take away from this is, you know, we don't know what field you're going into, what specific position in, in healthcare uh, that you're going to be working in. But I, I think everyone has a responsibility to uh, consider what it means to be trauma-informed within their scope of their work. Uh, both in terms of how they're advocating for that at a larger level in their organization, uh, as well as how they're interacting with their with their colleagues and their patients. Uh, and so I would encourage you to take some time to think about what that means specifically for you uh, and start to think about what you would need to work on uh, in your own preparations, in your own professional development uh, to be able to start moving towards a trauma-informed approach in your work. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for your attention uh, and we hope you have a great day.